Our, our message tonight is uh, part two or, uh, of uh, the message that we preached the last time, forgiveness, faith, and freedom. Say those three words. Do you believe in those three words? Do you believe in those three virtues? Forgiveness, faith, and freedom. Part two. I want to read from Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39, as a scriptural text. I love this verse in the Living Bible. Listen! Exclamation point. That's what it says. Listen! Say, I'm listening. Listen, in this man Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who trusts in him is freed from all guilt and is declared righteous something the religious law could never do. Now there's your three points. Listen. In this man there is forgiveness for your sins. Forgiveness. Everyone who trusts, there's faith. Everyone who trusts in him is freed from all guilt. Freed from all guilt. The bondage of guilt is over and is declared righteous. Say, I am declared righteous because I trust in this man Jesus. I think one of the touching stories that I ever read about forgiveness was Corrie Ten Boom. You've heard her tell it probably here in Tulsa. I never tire of reflecting on it. Anytime I see it in copy, I always read through it and live it again. And I've heard different, vari di different variations of it. But, uh, you know, she was uh, tortured for so long in a Nazi concentration camp and was finally liberated when the Allies uh, conquered Germany. And uh, she... Uh, she was set free, but, but, but it took time. Uh, it, she was liberated, but it took time to get rid of the simmering hatred that had filled her heart. And so to cure her own self, someone said, forgive me and heal yourself. You ever think about that? We're talking about forgiveness, the all healing power. To heal herself, she set down, she set out on a forgiving mission. Isn't that a beautiful project? To set out in the world to help people discover forgiveness. And in helping people find healing for the scars, for the, for the bruises, and the wounds of their malice and hatred, Cory Ten Boom discovered that in helping people discover that, she could find healing for her own hatred. And everywhere she went, throughout Holland, throughout France, throughout Germany, as she journeyed about preaching her gospel of forgiveness, the people were eager to hear her. And especially in Germany, where the, many of the people seemed to carry uh, a share of guilt inside them for their government, that had uh, done such terrible things. 
And they were very, the German people particularly, were so responsive wherever Corey went with her gospel of forgiveness. And they say that one day in Munich, after she had preached her great sermon, and God had blessed, and many had come forward, and many were forgiven, and tears were flowing among those that were greeting Corey in tears and gladness and strong handshakes and hugs and greetings was a gentleman who stood up, extended his hand, and spoke to Corey and said, Yes, Corey, yes, thank God he does forgive all of our sins, but she recognized his voice. It was the voice of the man who had tortured her so much during the concentration period. It was the voice of the man who had given her such cruel orders, who had stood by jeering, leering, mocking, making fun as she was forced to strip nude and shower with other women before him. It was the voice of the man who had done her so much hurt and Corey froze inside and did not extend her hand and withdrew in a moment of, of panic and laid her head over her arm and prayed, oh God, help me, forgive me, but I cannot forgive this man. And like a flash, she said, something warm came through me, and I knew I was forgiven even for not forgiving. Mercy, a miracle, a healing. And in that moment, regathering her strength, she could, with all of her heart, extend her hand, that quick it happened, extend her hand back to the man and shake his hand as her brother. And with that handshake and that powerful, spontaneous miracle on the spot, Corey was able to release the wounds of the past and lift the curtain on a new dawn of a new day that was freed from all of the baggage and the burden of non-forgiveness. Anybody here tonight need to do that to somebody? Anybody here tonight holding anything in your heart that needs to be put away, needs to be forgiven, needs to be wiped out by you, by the act of your will. What a wonderful thing that we have the power to do that. The sense of being forgiven gave Corey the power to forgive. And you know, there is no sense, there is no, there is no sensation, there is no realization of being forgiven without the understanding of the immeasurable love of God toward you and toward me. And if he loved us when we were yet his enemies, then we can appropriate that love and extend it to somebody else. And in that way, we fit in to God's miracle flow. And the miracle we receive, we give. Get a miracle and give a miracle. Take a miracle and share a miracle. It's the way 
that God has it planned and it's the way Jesus brought us the message of forgiveness. And there's no power like it. It's the power of love energizing the greatest miracle on earth, forgiveness. Wiping out the past and bringing up a brand new day, new opportunities, a new beginning, a new lifestyle. Without the baggage and without the burden and without the hurts and without the bru bruises. Healed, renewed, rejuvenated. Hallelujah. Forgiveness. Number one, the fact of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Acts 13, the scripture we read. Listen, in this man Jesus there is forgiveness of sins. Fact of forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Somebody said forgiveness is God's invention. To heal our hurts, our bruises, our pains, and to give us a new start. God's invention. Forgiveness. Luke 1, is beautiful in the Living Bible. The, live, the, the mission of Christ was to tell people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you for the enthusiasm. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. As well as your claps, give him the fruit of your lips in praise. Amen. In truth. The mission of Christ was to tell people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of sins. That's our mission. That's my mission. That's your mission. That's what I'm here for. To tell people how to have forgiveness of sin. How to have salvation through the forgiveness of sins. You get the forgiveness of sins, you're free. You're new. You're changed. Life begins again when the forgiveness of sins comes. Because when the forgiveness of sins comes, all of the devil's contact points are rubbed out. And he is a loser with no more right and no more terrain in that life. The forgiveness of sins, salvation, deliverance. Acts 5, 31. God has exalted Jesus Christ to be the Savior and to give forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Same word, remission. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Let it be known that through Jesus Christ is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all who believe are justified. A formidable verse. By him, this man, listen, in this man there's forgiveness of sin. By him, all who believe are justified. just as if they'd never sinned. There's nothing like the power that we have to share with people when we bring them the message of Jesus Christ and his power to wipe out their sins through his blood so that they know that they have experienced remission of sins and they have a new beginning and they're justified. Justified means just as if I'd never done it. 
which means that we have the power to come to people who are so messed up in life and we come to you tonight with this message whatever the mess ups in life that you've experienced we come to you to tell you whatever is wrong whatever you've done whatever sin you've committed whatever wrong whatever abuse you've committed there is a power in Jesus. In him there's forgiveness of sins. And when you believe on him, whoever believes is justified. And you have a brand new beginning. And you can start over and have a new life with Christ. That's worth telling about. Now let's, let's look a little bit at Luke chapter 7. Verse thir verses 36 to 50. The beautiful story about this prostitute. Jesus accepted the invitation to eat at the Pharisee's house. His name was Simon. The woman was a sinner of that area. The Bible calls her that. And she came into the meeting. Now I don't know whether she would have tried that had Jesus not been there, I have my doubts. But oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. Wherever he is, the most unworthy person feels welcome. The most, the most unwanted person is wanted. The rejects of society is welcome wherever Jesus is. Jesus is in my life. He lives at my house. Therefore, wherever I am, those who are down on themselves are welcome. And they can come and get around me and they'll stand up and feel better. I believe that. I believe that's our ministry. Hallelujah. And so she came and she had this brilliant idea to bring this box of, this alabaster box of precious ointment. And she came in where Jesus was, I presume, uh, lounging on a couch in, in Roman custom. I don't know. I don't know exactly. That's a guess. But wherever he was, she approached him and she began to, you know, weep, weep. Why was she weeping when she came in like that? Why did she come to him weeping? You know, if we understand, if we can get a glimpse into the hearts of hurting people, how they long to make contact with the Savior and with the Lord and be healed and be blessed. They're hurting. And they value so much the mercy of God. Let us never frighten them off. Let us never be self-righteous around them. Let us always go out of our way to welcome them and let them feel at home. For many of them, just below the surface, if not already spilling over, are the tears of their own remorse for their own life. She came weeping, washing his feet, kissing his feet, washing them with her tears, wiping them with her hair. The self-righteous critics reacted very strong and made this sarcastic statement. Had this guy been a real prophet, he would have known who this one is. That's real cold. Now immediately what I think is, if they knew this one, they knew the other one too and the other one, and the other one. And I have the idea, judging by principle and by their reaction, 
They knew all of them and were their clients, probably, because they sure knew this one. And they said, had he been a true prophet, he would have known this woman, this one, was a sinner. <clears throat> Jesus let him talk. After a while, when the woman finished, he moved over and said, Simon, let's have a talk. He said, you know, I knew a guy that had two debtors. One of them owed him 500 pence and one of them owed him 50. This was a good guy. He felt very sympathetic toward these debtors, knew their circumstances, and he just frankly forgave them both. Which one of them loved him the most? And Simon came right out with it. Well, said that one that, that, that he owed 500 pence. Well, Jesus said, Simon, this woman whose many sins have been forgiven, this woman, think about her. I came in here to you. You gave me no water. You gave me no kiss. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She did it all. She, she wet my feet with her tears. She wiped my feet with her hair. She anointed my head with precious ointment. Her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Fact, there is forgiveness of sins when we come to our Lord. No case is impossible. That is our message to hurting people. And they're dying out there all around us who do not know that. But they believe that God is angry at them and that an awful judgment is impending for them. And they are frightened and so they cover their sins with more sins and heap misery upon misery until they end it all, until they break up their family, until they ruin their life, and all they need is you and me to go with our text and say, hey, listen, in this man Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. And whoever will believe on him will be justified. Oh, I never want to tire of giving that message to people, sure to multitudes, but to one one, as the Nigerians say also, one one, to go to them and find them and discern their hurt and pour out the good news to them. That's our ministry. Say, I believe it. Hallelujah. Then when he got through Simon, he turned back to the lady and said, and I read this in the last message, part one, thy three things, thy sins are forgiven. That's forgiveness. Number two, thy faith hath saved thee. That's faith. Go in peace. That's freedom. Hallelujah. The scribes, in verse 49, reacted again. They said, right while he was talking to the woman, it's inserted in between his statements. They said, who is this that forgives sin? The healing miracle that you and I have the power to release in people and give them a new beginning. Do you believe that? So Jesus does several things like that to get across the idea that he's come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's come to give forgiveness, to bring forgiveness to hurting people. 
You know, there's no pain that one bears in their hearts like the pain of being unforgiven before God. That's the root of fear and dread and anger and hatred and murder and strife. It's all an outcry from the desperation that pours out of a frightened soul that is harboring unforgiveness. Not right before God or not right before people having harmed people. And we are the messengers of life and light and freedom. Hallelujah. Of forgiveness, of faith, and of freedom to everybody whose ear we can capture for just a short time. It don't take long because what we got is so powerful. So the Lord really underscores this in some of his earliest teaching when, he, when the disciples are attracted about his way of prayer and he outlines for them what we call the Lord's Prayer, but really is our prayer, the disciples' prayer, his followers' prayer, you know. And, uh, and he tells us in Matthew 6, verse 12 of that chapter, in the midst of that prayer that he taught us, he said, and forgive us our debts. And there's, the, there's an equation. As we forgive our debtors. Then he finishes up the prayer and then when he puts the amen, he goes back and tacks the postscript on that part of the prayer. And I have an idea that that was his biggest point that he wanted to make. And that's why he doubled back and made it all by itself as the last word. For if you forgive people their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if you don't forgive people their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses. So forgiving is a two-way street. There's forgiveness in this man Jesus. But it has an equation on it, doesn't it? It has a measuring stick on it. It's as we forgive people. Let's look a little bit more about that. The Bible says a little about forgiveness in the Old Testament. I preached that in the, last, in the first part of this message. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, the word forgive only has to do with God forgiving people. There's nothing in the Old Testament taught about people forgiving people. Now, I mentioned several interesting things the last time I preached. And it, it created curiosity in me. I wondered why the word forgive didn't even appear in Scripture until the last chapter of Genesis. And I told you about that. And then a, once or twice in the book of Exodus, but each time carefully concerning God forgiving people. And then we go into Numbers, into Leviticus, and all the record, and there we see a lot about forgiveness, but it's all God forgiving people. And I wondered why in the Old Testament there's not any, not a single use of the word forgive that has to do with people forgiving people. And I have to say tonight, as I've looked further into it, I'm not able to give you an answer to that. But I have done some, quite a bit of looking into Jewish tradition. And I find that throughout the Old Testament history and throughout Hebraic teaching, Forgiveness was a very prominent part of their teaching. Now, I still don't understand why it doesn't come out in the Bible. Perhaps there are other words 
that depict this. Pardon? It's identical. It's the same word. It's not pardon. So uh, I've searched for that. I haven't had the time to search all the cases. Uh, so the only way we can prove it is to go through the Old Testament and look at the examples of forgiveness of people forgiving people. To know that they were taught to do that. But, uh, but throughout Hebrew tradition, it's very clear that they believed that, and that they taught that people were to forgive people. The Encyclopedia Judaica is a very formidable uh, uh, a group of books to study and is very helpful in, uh, in uh, understanding uh, many things in the Old Testament. The Jews were very firm in teaching forgiveness. They taught that it means to purify. Jeremiah 33, 8, I will cleanse them from all things, from all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and trespassed against me. In the word forgiveness, it means God's forgiveness. It means not only to purify you, but it means to wipe your sins away. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out your transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That's the forgiveness that there is in God. Do you believe that? It's, it means to wash them away. Isaiah 1, 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, a washing, a purging of sins. Forgiveness is a purging of sins. You know, when God forgives, he really forgives. He purifies you. He wipes it away. He washes it away. He purges you. Psalms 51, Psalm 51, 4. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The old hymn that we sing that about. But, but the most prominent title in God's role as a forgiver is, quote, one who lifts off sin. Isn't it wonderful to see how God purges us and washes us and purifies us? Then we come into New Testament, we pick up new words like justify and remit. All these are even better words. But under the old covenant, purged us, purged us purified us, washed us, wiped us, and lifts off our sins. Look at Exodus 34. Moses was called up into the mountain. God calls him up there, and he tells him to bring two freshly hewn tablets, tables of stone, that he's going to talk to him. And when Moses appears before God, there the Lord descends in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. I like that. Oh, I love to hear the name of the Lord proclaimed. What must it have been like that day when God came in the cloud proclaiming his own name? Wow! I, I, I imagine Moses thought it was thundering again, don't you? Verse 6 of Exodus 34. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Isn't it wonderful that God would come like that? Listen, I'm preaching the fact of forgiveness. Listen, the Bible said. My text said, listen, in this man Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. I want to proclaim to the world, there's pardon, there's release, there's a new beginning, there's a new tomorrow. You don't have to live under your load. Hallelujah. And God comes down in that cloud. Moses with his fresh tablets of stone, ready to do business. God, obviously, we know now in retrospect, ready to write with the finger of God and record the Ten Commandments. But God comes in the smoke, in the cloud, and proclaim 
That's what he said. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. Isn't that remarkable that God would come on the scene talking like that? Friends, don't live estranged from God. Young people, don't live your life estranged from God. Have communion with God. God is ready to reestablish himself with every one of you, no matter what's happened. Take a new beginning. When God reveals himself, he comes in the cloud, proclaims his name, and says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth. Hallelujah. Oh, that's good enough for me. I say, Lord, hallowed be your name. I honor you, abundant in mercy and in truth for me. And I take my healing by faith in the word of God that he proclaims. Can you do that? Micah, in one of his prophecies, Chapter 7, verse 18 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Isn't that precious? That's our Father. That's our God. That's our Lord. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's the God I proclaim. Hallelujah. Now in Hebrew teaching, of course they were very methodical in everything. They categorized sins in two kinds. Sins that were committed against God and sins that were committed against people. I knew when I found that out, I was beginning to find, I, then I became more curious, why don't we find something in the Bible, the Old Testament says something about forgiving one another. But I began to look in some of the Hebrew teachings and they emphasized that sins committed against God, there's no limit to forgiveness. But they teach it's not enough to hope and pray for pardon. They outline three or four things. They say, you got to humble yourself. They say, you got to acknowledge your sins. They say, you got to resolve to depart from your sins. And then they say, you've got to follow your remorse by outward acts. In other words, follow your remorse, translate it into deeds. Do something to show that you're sorry for what you did against God. Show it in action. That's good doctrine, isn't it? Joshua 24, 23 said, incline the heart to the Lord. Ezekiel 18, 31 said, make oneself a new heart. Jeremiah 4, 4 said, to circumcise the heart. Hosea 10, 12 says, break up the fallow ground. Now the Jews taught these principles with, with, in so many ways, but then dominating all other thoughts, there was one verb that they used Above all others, the verb S-H-U-V. Sounds like shuv to me. I don't know how they'd pronounce it. Uh, but the Hebrew verb shuv. And I understand that as that comes along, that turns into T-E-S-H-U-V-A-H. -E -S Teshuva. Something like that. Which is the Greek word for repentance. So now we're beginning to make sense out of it. 
to, to humble ourselves, acknowledge our sin, resolve to depart from it, and to follow our resolve with action that shows evidence that we are turning from our way. And so it all ends up, it implies a turning from our way. And so the rabbis point out how wonderful this is, that this proves that human persons have built into them a power to be able to choose a power of volition that you can stop what you're doing, turn around, turn your back on it, go the other direction, and go toward God instead of toward your sin. And I think that's good doctrine, don't you? You know, there was a fellow that attended our church in Oregon. Uh, his name was Billy Barnes. And, uh, you know, back in those days, that was back in 1940. What was it, 43? Long about then? A long time ago. Most of you weren't born. Well, he was an old man then. So when he talked about his childhood, he was talking about the Wild West of America. We had an old woman in our church that came to Oregon in a covered wagon. She, she was over 90 years old. We were 25 or 20 or 22 along about then. And she was 90. And she was the most precious old saint. And she had come to Oregon on the Oregon Trail in a covered wagon. Well, Billy Barnes had come to Oregon on horseback. He had been a bootlegger and a cow wrestler, a cattle rustler in, in uh, Colorado and really became uh, quite a wealthy man, rustling cattle, stealing cattle, taking them to market, selling them. And he was a bootlegger and a drunkard with it, a rough western cowboy. In one of the shoot-ups, he was wounded, lost one of his legs, and spent his life uh, with a wooden leg. And it was a peg leg. It was just an old wooden peg leg. Uh, he didn't have any artificial limb. He had a peg leg. <laughs> and Billy Barnes was a saint. He had gotten converted. And when he found Jesus, he found real salvation. And Billy Barnes, at the time that we were there pastoring him, Listen, Billy Barnes and his wife, every morning, they were, they were shoe cobblers. And they had quite a uh, big business. Every morning, they got up, and the first two hours of their day that was uh, on their knees. And uh, they, they fasted very often. When Billy Barnes would come in the door, you didn't notice it because you heard the peg leg hitting the floor, but you noticed it because the power of the Lord was with Billy Barnes, his wife. They were, they were people of God, beautiful people. Sometimes he would stand up and just sing a song, and the power of God would fall because he was a saint. He, by that I mean he lived close to God. Now, that's not out of our reach today. We have people like that today. God wants us to be expressive in our Christianity and let the world know what's happened to us and live in contact with people. Billy Barnes' shoe cobbler shop was a soul winning station. Every day it was open and it was open early to late and everybody that came in, everybody, Billy Barnes did nothing but stand there behind that old counter with that propped on that old pe uh, on that one leg and, and with that he wouldn't keep that peg leg on him but with that stump he had a prop built under the counter where he could uh, steady himself and he was there working on shoes and testifying of Jesus all day. Anybody, anybody that came in there, he witnessed to all of them and he always, they have, if they was ready to pray, he was ready to get them saved. Now, when someone like that comes in church, you know someone's come to church. You know, it's a wonderful thing. The greatest power there is in a Christian life is the power that takes place, that sets up headquarters in a Christian who is in contact with hurting people. 
and is expressing the Jesus life to people. That's the kind of a man Billy Barnes was. And I'll tell you, he was still paying on debts. Now, it had been about 15 years that Billy Barnes and his wife had been paying on debts that were honest debts to him because he really found God and he didn't want to leave any trace of his sin behind him and he wanted to clear all of his tracks. Isn't that beautiful to see? You know, that, no wonder the power of God was with that man. But uh, I, I wanted to impress that on you. Uh, God, God in the Old Testament was a real forgiver of sins, overlooking sins, not imputing sins. Psalms 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, the one to whom the Lord will not impute sins. The Lord doesn't remember sins. Psalms 25 verse 7, remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgressions, but according to your mercy, remember me. Hallelujah. God, God, who proclaims himself as the forgiving God, the love God, the Lord God, wants to forgive us. He hides his face from our sins. Psalms, Psalm 51, 9. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Hallelujah. Psalm 103 verse 12. He removes our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. He throws our sins behind his back. Isaiah 38 17, thou hast in love for my soul delivered me from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. My God that comes in the cloud and shows himself and proclaims himself, I am God, I am among you, I am the Lord, merciful, Gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth. He casts our, sea, our sins into the sea. Micah 7, 19. He'll cast all of my sins into the depths of the sea. In other Hebrew scriptures, one rabbi wrote, says the Holy One, or the Holy One says, even if, we, if our sins should reach to heaven, if you'll repent, I will forgive you. I like that, don't you? I'd take that scripture. I like that. And, and concerning this verse in Exodus that I read to you, the Lord descending in a cloud, revealing himself, proclaiming his name, the, uh, the Toshefta, says God's quality. They, one, one, one of the rabbis even calculated how much God could forgive. You know, the Jews, they never quit. They figure out everything. <laughs> and, and one of them says, God's, and it's written, one of them says, God's quality of forgiveness is at least 500 times stronger than his wrath. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I believe that about God. His goodness is far greater than his anger. I may displease him, but I run to him and I call for his mercy. And his mercy is far greater than his anger. Hallelujah. In the Talmud, they give an interesting picture of God praying to himself. <laughs> Can you imagine this word picture of God praying to himself? And among the things that God's praying to himself to be sure that happens is this. He's praying that his mercy should always prevail over his anger. <laughs> 
And then they add this. God's also praying for this, that he should forgive his children even though justice would really demand their punishment. You know, to have the kind of concept that would, that would uh, draft ideas like that encourages me and lifts me because I know that now under the new covenant I have discovered God is so much better than all the Jews could possibly try to say that he is. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. A, the great, a great Hebrew philosopher said in his commentary on the Mishnah, he calls it the Torah reviewed. He said, even if one has sinned all of his life and repents on the day of his death, all of his sins are forgiven. I'm glad they figured that out. I know that. I'm under the new covenant. I've got better promises, but I'm glad they figured that out. Even if you sin all your life, even on the day of your death if you repent, there's forgiveness. I'm saying to you tonight, there's forgiveness in this man, Jesus. Hallelujah. Interesting to note, they're talking about these sins to God. They said these, these sins, even though they're forgiven though, they said the forgiveness is not actually credited to them until the day of atonement or until the day they die. That's when they really get the credit. <clears throat> And I thought, isn't that interesting? And doesn't that help you understand how that the prophets could be caught up by the spirit of foreknowledge and see this Jesus who was slain from the foundation of the world and utter those words like Isaiah 53, he made his soul an offering for our sins. He bore the iniquity of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions, talking in past tense, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Looking ahead to the day when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be slain who had been slain from the foundation of the world, at which time his holy blood would be honored in the mercy seat of heaven, on the mercy seat of heaven, in the holy place of heaven, and retrospectively, retroactively applicable to all down through the ages who had looked with trust to him on that great day of atonement, the real atonement, the real remission. Hallelujah. And they had it in example every day. They went through their ceremony, but it didn't really count till the day of atonement. Or if they died, they'd get the credit for it. It'd be okay. <laughs> but that, don't you understand, doesn't that help you understand how they could look ahead and believe? And no wonder God credited, imputed to them righteousness for they doing all they could do. Following out these formalities and these ceremonies were looking by a faith that they didn't even understand to the day when full credit would be given. Hallelujah. And since Christ died and led captivity captive, glory to God, now having risen from the dead, he's brought with him all those who trusted in him, even under the old covenant. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, I'm so glad I know that. Praise the Lord. God is wanting you to know the fact of forgiveness. It's real. You can have a new beginning. You can have a change. You tonight can have a change. And we began with a clean slate for all who believe on him are justified before God. When I come to the end of life, the only plea 
I want to hold before God is nothing but the blood of Jesus. I want to rest my case on the sacrifice of Jesus, believing that there is forgiveness in this man Jesus. And I stand justified before God who made Jesus to be righteousness, redemption, sanctification to me, him, because him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ, who his own self bear our own sins in his own flesh on the tree that we being dead to sins dead to sins might live unto righteousness by whose stripes were healed the all healing power of forgiveness the life the light I have the life. I see the way. I see the cross. I see the sacrifice. I see the love. I stand in awe. I read of him coming. Even under the old covenant. In the cloud. Proclaiming his name. The Lord the Lord God merciful gracious long-suffering abundant in goodness that's what I hear I hear the echoes of heaven and it's good news that I hear it's glad tidings of great joy of good things for all people I've heard the message, the fact of forgiveness. There is forgiveness in this man, Jesus. Do you believe it? Hallelujah. Close your eyes. I pray for you who have watched my video. May the forgiving Jesus reach out his hand to you now. Reach out and take his hand. Don't analyze it. Don't try to figure it out. Just as I am, I come to thee, O God. O Lamb of God, I come, the song says. Don't try to make yourself good. Lean, rely on Jesus Christ. He sent you this message, whoever you are. I pray in the name of Jesus that he'll give you the strength to say, yes, Jesus, I accept you. Right now, I believe that your blood was shed for me in Jesus' name.